Hibernation 60. Grizzly's Growls presents Stories from the Hibernation. Read by David Grizzly Smith. Wild Animals I Have Known by Ernest Thompson Seton As read by David Grizzly Smith Redruff, The Story of the Down Valley Partridge Part 1 down the wooded slope of Taylor's Hill the mother partridge led her brood, down toward the crystal brook that by some strange whim was called Mud Creek. Her little ones were one day old, but already quick on foot, and she was taking them for the first time to drink. She walked slowly, crouching low as she went, for the woods were full of enemies. She was uttering a soft little cluck in her throat, a call to the little balls of mottled down that on their tiny pink legs came toddling after, and peeping softly and plaintively, if left even a few inches behind, and seeming so fragile they made the very chickadees look big and coarse. There were twelve of them, but Mother Grouse watched them all, and she watched every bush and tree and thicket, and the whole woods and the sky itself. Always for enemies she seemed seeking— Friends were too scarce to be looked for, and an enemy she found. Away across the level beaver meadow was a great brute of a fox. He was coming this way, and in a few moments would surely win them or strike their trail. There was no time to lose. Krr, krr, hide, hide, cried the mother in a low, firm voice, and the little bits of things, scarcely bigger than acorns and but a day old, scattered far, a few inches apart, to hide. One dived under a leaf, another between two roots, and a third crawled into a curl of birch bark, a fourth into a hole, and so on, till all were hidden but one, who could find no cover, so squatted on a broad yellow chip and lay very flat, closed his eyes very tight, sure that now he was safe from being seen. They ceased their frightened peeping, and all was still. Mother Partridge flew straight toward the dreaded beast, alighted fearlessly a few yards to one side of him, and then flung herself on the ground, flopping as though winged and lame, oh, so dreadfully lame, and whining like a distressed puppy. Was she begging for mercy? Mercy from a bloodthirsty, cruel fox? Oh, dear, no! She was no fool. One often hears of the cunning of the fox. Wait and see what a fool he is compared with a Mother Partridge. Elated at the prize so suddenly within his reach, the fox turned with a dash and caught. At least, no, he didn't quite catch the bird. She flopped by chance just a foot out of reach. He followed with another jump, and would have seized her this time, surely, but somehow a sapling came just between, and the partridge dragged herself awkwardly away and under a log, but the great brute snapped his jaws and bounded over the log, while she, seeming a trifle less lame, made another clumsy forward spring and tumbled down a bank, and Renard, keenly following, almost caught her tail. But oddly enough, fast as he went and lipped, she still seemed just a trifle faster. It was most extraordinary. A winged partridge, and he, Reynard, the swift foot, had not caught her in five minutes racing. It was really shameful. But the partridge seemed to gain strength as the fox put forth his, and after a quarter of a mile race, racing that was somehow all the way from Taylor's Hill, the bird got unaccountably quite well and rising with a derisive whirr, flew off through the woods, leaving the fox utterly dumbfounded to realize he had been made a fool of, and, worst of all, 
He now remembered that this was not the first time he had been served this very trick, though he never knew the reason for it. Meanwhile, Mother Partridge skimmed in a great circle and came by a roundabout way back to the little fuzzballs she left hidden in the woods. With a wild bird's keen memory for places, she went to the very grass blade she last trod on and stood for a moment fondly to admire the perfect stillness of her children, even had her step not one had stirred. And the little fella on the chip, not so very badly concealed after all, had not budged, nor did he now. He only closed his eyes a tiny little bit harder, till the mother said, Kurit, come, children. And instantly, like a fairy story, every hole gave up its little baby partridge, and the wee fella on the chip, the biggest of them all, really, opened his big little eyes and ran to the shelter of her broad tail with a sweet little peep-peep, which an enemy could not have heard three feet away, but which his mother could not have missed thrice as far, and all the other thimblefuls of down joined in, and no doubt thought themselves dreadfully noisy, and were proportionately happy. The sun was hot now. There was an open space to cross on the road to the water, and after a careful lookout for enemies, the mother gathered the little things under the shadow of her spread fantail and kept off all danger of sunstroke until they reached the briar thicket by the stream. Here a cottontail rabbit leaped out and gave them a great scare, but the flag of truce he carried behind was enough. He was an old friend, and among other things the little ones learned that day that Bunny always sails under a flag of truce and lives up to it, too. And then came the drink, the purest of living water, though silly men called it Mud Creek. At first the little fellows didn't know how to drink, but they copied their mother and soon learned to drink like her and give thanks after every sip. There they stood in a row along the edge, twelve little brown and golden balls on twenty-four little pink-toed interned feet, with twelve sweet little golden heads gravely bowing, drinking, and giving thanks like their mother. Then she led them by short stages, keeping to cover, to the far side of the beaver meadow, where was a great grassy dome. The mother had made a note of this dome some time before. It takes a number of such domes to raise a brood of partridges, for this was an ant's nest. The old one stepped on top, looked about a moment, then gave a half a dozen vigorous rakes with her claws. The friable ant hill was broken open, and the earthen galleries scattered in ruins down the slope. The ants swarmed out and quarreled with each other, for lack of a better plan. Some ran around the hill with vast energy and little purpose, while a few of the more sensible began to carry away fat white eggs. But the old partridge, coming to the little ones, picked up one of these juicy-looking bags and clucked and dropped it, and picked it up again and again and clucked and then swallowed it. The young one stood around, and then one little yellow fellow, the one that sat on the chip, picked up an ant egg, dropped it a few times, then, yielding to a sudden impulse, swallowed it, so had learned to eat. Within twenty minutes even the runt had learned, and a merry time they had, scrambling after the delicious eggs, as their mother broke open more ant galleries, and sent them and their contents rolling down the bank till every little partridge had so crammed his little crop that he was positively misshapen and could eat no more. Then all went cautiously up the stream, and on a sandy bank, well screened by brambles, they lay for all that afternoon, and learned how pleasant it was to feel the cool powdery dust running between their hot little toes. With their strong bent for copying, they lay on their sides like their mother, scratched with their tiny feet and flopped with their wings. Though they had no wings to flop with, only a little tag among the down on each side to show where the wings would come. With that night she took them to a dry thicket nearby, and there, among the crisp dead leaves that would prevent an enemy's silent approach on foot, and under the interlacing briars that kept off all foes of the air, she cradled them in their feather-shingled nursery and rejoiced in the fullness of a mother's joy over the wee cuddling things that peeped in their sleep and snuggled so trustfully against her warm body.
Part 2 The third day, the chicks were much stronger on their feet. They no longer had to go around an acorn. They could even scramble over pine cones, and on the little tags that marked the places for their wings were now to be seen blue rows of fat blood quills. Their start in life was a good mother, good legs, a few reliable instincts, and a germ of reason. It was instinct, that is, inherited habit, which taught them to hide at the word from their mother. It was instinct that taught them to follow her. But it was reason which made them keep under the shadow of her tail when the sun was smiting down, and from that day reason entered more and more into their expanding lives. Next day the blood quills had sprouted the tips of feathers. On the next the feathers were well out, and a week later the whole family of down-clad babies were strong on the wing. And yet not all. Poor little Runty had been sickly from the first. He bore his half-shell on his back for hours after he came out. He ran less and cheeped more than his brothers, and when one evening at the onset of a skunk the mother gave the word, Kweet, kweet, fly, fly, Runty was left behind, and when she gathered her brood on the piney hill he was missing, and they saw him no more. Meanwhile their training had gone on. They knew that the finest grasshoppers abounded in the long grass by the brook. They knew that the currant bushes dropped fatness in the form of smooth green worms. They knew that the dome of an anthill rising against the distant woods stood for a garner of plenty. They knew that strawberries, though not really insects, were almost as delicious. They knew that huge denate butterflies were a good safe game if they could only catch them and that a slab of bark dropping from the side of a rotten log was sure to abound in good things of many different kinds. And they learned also that yellow jackets, mud wasps, woolly worms, and hundred leggers were better let alone. It was now July, the moon of berries. The chicks had grown and flourished amazingly during this last month, and were now so large that in her efforts to cover them the mother was kept standing all night. They took their daily dust bath, but of late had changed to another higher on the hill. It was one in use by many different birds, and at first the mother disliked the idea of such a second-hand bath. But the dust was of such a fine, agreeable quality, and the children led the way with enthusiasm that she forgot her mistrust. After a fortnight the little ones began to droop, and she herself did not feel very well. They were always hungry, and though they ate enormously, they one and all grew thinner and thinner. The mother was last to be affected, but when it came, it came as hard on her, a ravenous hunger, a feverish headache, and a wasting weakness. She never knew the cause. She could not know that the dust of the much-used dust-bath, that her true instinct taught her to mistrust at first, and now again to shun, was sown with parasitic worms, and that all of the family were infested. Now no natural impulse is without a purpose. The mother bird's knowledge of healing was only to follow natural impulse. The eager, feverish craving for something, she knew not what, led her to eat, or try, everything that looked edible, and to seek the coolest woods, and there she found a deadly sumac, laden with its poison fruit. A month ago she would have passed it by, but now she tried the unattractive berries. The acrid burning juice seemed to answer some strange demand of her body. She ate and ate, and all her family joined in the strange feast of physic. No human doctor could have hit it better. It proved a biting, drastic purge. The dreadful secret foe was downed, the danger passed but not for all. Nature, the old nurse, had come too late for two of them. The weakest, by inexorable law, dropped out. Enfeebled by the disease, the remedy was too severe for them. They drank and drank by the stream, and next morning did not move when the others followed the mother. Strange vengeance was theirs now, for a skunk, the same that could have told where Runty went, found and devoured their bodies, and died of the poison they had eaten. Seven little partridges now obeyed the mother's call. 
Their individual characters were early shown and now developed fast. The weaklings were gone, but there were still a fool and a lazy one. The mother could not help caring for some more than for others, and her favorite was the biggest, he who once sat on the yellow chip for concealment. He was not only the biggest, strongest, and handsomest of the brood, but, best of all, the most obedient. His mother's warning, rrr, danger, did not always keep the others from a risky path or a doubtful food, but obedience seemed natural to him, and he never failed to respond to her soft creech, come. And of this obedience he reaped the reward, for his days were longest in the land. August, the molting moon, went by. The young ones were now three parts grown. They knew just enough to think themselves wonderfully wise. When they were small it was necessary to sleep on the ground so their mother could shelter them, but now they were too big to need that, and their mother began to introduce grown-up ways of life. It was time to roost in the trees. The young weasels, foxes, skunks, and minks were beginning to run. The ground grew more dangerous each night, so at sundown Mother Partridge called Kareets and flew into a thick, low tree. The little ones followed, except one, an obstinate little fool who persisted in sleeping on the ground as heretofore. He was all right that time, but the next night his brothers were awakened by his cries. There was a slight scuffle, and then stillness, broken only by a horrid sound of crunching bones and a smacking of lips. They peered down into the terrible darkness below, where the glint of two close-set eyes and a peculiar musty smell told them that a mink was the killer of their fool brother. Six little partridges now sat in a row at night, with their mother in the middle, though it was not unusual for some little one with cold feet to perch on her back. Their education went on, and about this time they were taught whirring. A partridge can rise on wings silently if it wishes, but whirring is so important at times that all are taught how and when to rise on thundering wings. Many ends are gained by the whir. It warns all other partridges near that danger is at hand. It unnerves the gunner, or it fixes the foe's attention on the whirrer while the others sneak off in silence or, by squatting, escape notice. A partridge adage might well be, foes and food for every moon. September came with seeds and grain in place of berries and ant eggs, and gunners in place of skunks and minks. Well, the partridges knew well what a fox was, but had scarcely seen a dog. A fox they knew they could easily baffle by taking to a tree. But when in the gunner moon old Cuddy came prowling through the ravine with his bob-tailed yellow cur, the mother spied the dog and cried out, Kweet, kweet, fly, fly. Well, two of the brood thought it was a pity their mother should lose her wits so easily over a fox and were pleased to show their superior nerve by springing into a tree in spite of her earnestly repeated, Kweet, kweet and her example of speeding away on silent wings. Meanwhile the strange bob-tailed fox came under the tree and yapped and yapped at them. They were much amused at him and at their mother and brothers, so much so that they never noticed a rustling in the bushes till there was a loud bang, bang, and down fell two bloody flopping partridges to be seized and mangled by the yellow cur until the gunner ran from the bushes and rescued the remains. Part 3 Cuddy lived in a wretched shanty near the dawn north of Toronto. His was what Greek philosophy would have demonstrated to be an ideal existence. He had no wealth, no taxes, no social pretensions, and no property to speak of. His life was made up of very little work and a great deal of play, with as much outdoor life as he chose. He considered himself a true sportsman because he was fond of hunting and took a sight of comfort out of seeing the critters hit the mud when his gun was fired. The neighbors called him a squatter and looked on him merely as an anchored tramp. He shot and trapped the year round, 
and varied his game somewhat with the season for force, but had been heard to remark he could tell the month by the taste of the partridges, if he didn't happen to know by the almanac. This, no doubt, showed keen observation, but was also unfortunate proof of something not so creditable. The lawful season for murdering partridges began September 15, but there was nothing surprising in cuttings being out a fortnight ahead of time. Yet he managed to escape punishment year after year, and even contrived to pose in a newspaper interview as an interesting character. He rarely shot on the wing, preferring to pot his birds, which was not easy to do when the leaves were on, and accounted for the brood in the third ravine going so long unharmed. But the near prospect of other gunners finding them now had stirred him to go after a mess of birds. He had heard no roar of wings when the mother bird let off her four survivors, so pocketed the two he had killed, and returned to the shanty. The little grouse thus learned that a dog is not a fox, and must be differently played and an old lesson was yet more deeply graven. Obedience is long life. The rest of September was passed in keeping quietly out of the way of the gunners as well as some old enemies. They still roosted on the long, thin branches of the hardwood trees among the thickest leaves which protected them from foes in the air. The height saved them from foes on the ground and left them nothing to fear but coons whose slow, heavy tread on the limber boughs never failed to give them timely warning. But the leaves were falling now, every month its foes and its food. This was nut time, and it was owl time, too. Barred owls coming down from the north doubled or trebled the owl population. The nights were getting frosty, and the coons less dangerous, so the mother changed the place of roosting to the thickest foliage of a hemlock tree. Only one of the brood disregarded the warning. Kareets, Kareets! He stuck to his swinging elm bough, now nearly naked, and a great yellow-eyed owl bore him off before morning. Mother and three young ones now were left, but they were as big as she was. Indeed, one, the eldest, he of the chip, was bigger. Their ruffs had begun to show, just the tips to tell what they would be like when grown, and not a little proud they were of them. The ruff is to the partridge what the train is to the peacock, his chief beauty and his pride. A hen's ruff is black, with a slight green gloss. A cock's is much larger and blacker, and is glossed with a more vivid bottle green. Once in a while a partridge is born of unusual size and vigor, whose ruff is not only larger, but by a peculiar kind of intensification is of a deep coppery red, iridescent with violet, green, and gold. Such a bird is sure to be a wonder to all who know him, and the little one, who had squatted on the chip and had always done what he was told, developed before the acorn mood had changed into all the glory of a gold and copper ruff, for this was red ruff the famous partridge of the Don Valley. Part 4 One day, late in the acorn moon, that is, about mid-October, as the Gross family were basking with full crops near a great pine log on the sunlit edge of the beaver meadow, they heard the far-away bang of a gun, and Redruff, acting on some impulse from within, leaped on a log, strutted up and down a couple of times, then, yielding to the elation of the bright, clear, bracing air, he whirred his wings in loud defiance. Then, giving fuller vent to this expression of vigor, just as a colt frisks to show how well he feels, he whirred yet more loudly, until, unwittingly, he found himself drumming and tickled with the discovery of this new power, thumped the air again and again till he filled the woods with a loud tattoo of the fully grown cock partridge. His brother and sister heard and looked on with admiration and surprise. So did his mother, but from that time she began to be a little afraid of him. In early November comes the moon of a weird foe. 
by a strange law of nature, not wholly without parallel among mankind, all partridges go crazy in the November moon of their first year. They become possessed of a mad hankering to get away somewhere. It does not matter much where. And the wisest of them do all sorts of foolish things in this period. They go drifting, perhaps, at speed over the country by night, and are cut in two by wires, or dash into lighthouses or locomotive headlights. Daylight finds them in all sorts of absurd places, in buildings, in open marshes, perched on telephone wires in a great city, or even on board of coasting vessels. The craze seems to be a relic of a bygone habit of migration, and it has at least one good effect. It breaks up the families and prevents the constant intermarrying, which would surely be fatal to their race. It always takes the young badly their first year, and they may have it again the second fall, for it is very catching. But in the third season it is practically unknown. Well, Red Ruff's mother knew it was coming as soon as she saw the frost grapes blackening and the maples shedding their crimson and gold. There was nothing to do but care for their health and keep them in the quietest part of the woods. The first sign of it came when a flock of wild geese went honking southward overhead. The young ones had never before seen such long-necked hawks and were afraid of them. But seeing that their mother had no fear, they took courage and watched them with intense interest. Was it the wild, clanging cry that moved them, or was it solely the inner prompting then come to the surface? A strange longing to follow took possession of each of the young ones. They watched those arrowy trumpeters fading away to the south, and sought out higher perches to watch them farther yet, and from that time things were no more the same. The November moon was waxing, and when it was full, the November madness came. The least vigorous of the flock were most affected. The little family was scattered. Red Ruff himself flew on several long, erratic night journeys. The impulse took him southward, but there lay the boundless stretch of Lake Ontario, so he turned again, and the waning of the mad moon found him once more in the Mud Creek Glen, but absolutely alone. Thank you for listening to Stories from the Hibernation. Comment on the website at grizzliesgrowls.com. This program is offered under a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives license.